So we're live. Um, I haven't done a live show or tied live uh, in a few weeks. Thought I'd just turn the cameras on. I've been tying most of the evening. Um, tying flatheads tonight. Nothing special, just a uh, regular bucktail. Right now just doing uh, a chartreuse head with a chartreuse tail or fluorescent yellow tail. So let's get set up. Looks like our audio is good and our pictures are good. So this is a must add 32755 uh, it's a one aught hook. It's a three eighths head, and this is a flat head. It's from a custom mold, but um, Do It has a, a head that's very similar to this, and also accepts that Mustad three two seven five five hook. Begin by just taking our pinch and this tail that I have it's it's a long thin uh, hairs that aren't very they don't have a lot of uh, texture to them in, in the sense um, waviness or curliness but this is this is a very nice soft tail the hair is fairly fine which is really good on this jig because as the head tapers down this tail will tend to look better tied slightly sparse and you can bush it up a little bit but then the uh, the collar in that case often ends up being a little bit wider than the uh, the head of the jig start um, around September uh, tying the ice jigs just to again fill up the inventory anticipate some of the colors that um, were surprisingly popular last year you know it, there, there's there's always something new I try to make sure I have a good selection but also I like to add a lot of those new colors and patterns and that seem to sell pretty well the year before so I do have a the uh, last video I did um, looking at uh, the old pipe jig um, I had a lot of good comments on that and um, some even questions people contacting me um, instant message and whatnot and uh, so the reception for that was so well and there's a couple more jigs that I, I'm gonna do um, again looking back at those jigs from the uh, late 60s early 70s and
Okay, let's see if we got sound now. And how am I going to go about doing this? So. Alright, we got this microphone, but this is not going to work. So bear with me. We're doing this all live. See about putting a lavalier microphone. Or do I have a longer cable? I just got. Bear with me. One more. So I just bought a new field recorder, and uh, I'm going to be playing with that, kind of going back into some of my old school, you know, when I first uh, went to college back in the late 80s, it was for radio and television. So I'm kind of getting slowly back into that as a hobby, of course this YouTube thing, but um, I've been looking at field recording. Let's see here. But I just bought a field recorder and was wondering why I have this extra cord. I don't need it. It's just this long thing. I'll probably never use it, but I'm using it today. So I will unplug this. now we should have sound. So what's it look like? Oh, I apologize for that, guys. I'm using a, a wireless mic hooked up to this boom mic, uh, a wireless transmitter, rather. And uh, it works great, but I've probably tied with it half a dozen times. Um, without charging it so I, that's my bad not paying attention to the, uh, the battery levels on my wireless mic so thanks Alex um, let me know if that uh, if the levels are okay so we'll keep tying so Rode it really good system the the wireless system um, it's a nice prosumer level um, but you got to keep it charged. All right, perfect. All right, here we go. So, as I was saying, the pinch on this is fairly thin, partially because of the hair and the, um, the texture, uh, how thin it is, but also because of the shape of the head. And as it tapers, if our pinch is too big, you're going to have a big step from your collar down to your to your head. So again, I'm just measuring the length of the body past the bend of the hook. This pinch, keep this pinch tight throughout the whole process. So that was four wraps towards the bend of the hook and four wraps to the head. And I just give that a twist.
Hey Steve, how you doing? So if this was two colors, of course I would start with the darkest color first, which gets twisted to what becomes the back of the jig as you fish it. And here I'm just restacking. just to get most of those hairs fairly uniform. And I didn't check the clock. What time is it? About 8.30 when we started. We've been expecting thunderstorms, so I wasn't even sure if I wanted to attempt recording anything if we were going to have big booming thunder but so far so good we need the rain don't really need a thunderstorm so that was a couple wraps towards the bend of the hook and then a couple back wraps back up to the head of the jig pull it through These are a real nice jig, it's a nice color. Of course we do these flat heads in all the typical colors that are popular. Uh, this fall, there's a couple guys I know that will be calling me for brown and green, brown and orange, green and orange. Uh, and they also like them with a stinger. I do, we do go pretty sparse, um, some, some might complain the way we're doing these now are um, not enough hair. Um, we usually do tip these so, so you know I don't load up the hook with a lot of hair. I do have some customers that like just one wing of color and that's it. And, and nothing on the underside. Uh, have another customer that likes just uh, crystal flash. Uh, what's the other one? The crinkle mirror flash. That was that's another flash that he really likes. And uh, that's all he wants on his jig. And then he'll tip it with. Uh, I guess they're fishing with minnows more than likely. And they're catching walleye. Mostly in the fall is when I'm getting those orders. Compared to what I would tie, you know, those bass jigs I did earlier this year, uh, you know, those are, are awful lot of hair on them. The hair uh, allows the jig to fall much slower. Um, of course, that was mimicking, you know, a crayfish. So, but that's not, that's not... Uh, what I'm concerned about with the walleye jig. I'm not trying to really bulk it up. Um, sometimes when we're fishing them, we're, we're ripping them pretty hard anyways um, and fishing them real fast. So there we go. I'm just measuring against the other color. Switch my grip and keep this tight. Yep, Alex, we, uh, I, t I get a lot of orders for stinger hooks. I like to use them myself. And, um, you know, the basic jig is what most of the stores that I'm selling to. That's what they'll stock. They do like to buy some of the, the fancier stuff, the stingers and the tinsel. Uh, but that's not what is mostly on the wall. And I've done uh, a few videos you can check out uh, where I where I add those stingers. It's the exact same way I add a uh, tandem hook on the big streamers that we use here in central New York in the Finger Lakes. The guys are trolling for lake trout in these great big streamers that I tie.
Darkman, how you doing? So I lock on the thread with open wraps. I on this uh, hook size hook shank, I go about halfway down, which is probably overdoing it just slightly. Um, but it's just a you know few wraps worth of thread. So I mentioned when I first began about the. Um, the reception I got with one of the last videos I did with uh, the uh, streamer style pattern pike jig, um, I have uh, partially completed and I'm going to um, probably at least finish the recording this weekend of uh, a pattern also again from the late 60s, early 70s. And it's from the, uh, do I have the book out still? I might have put it, I might have put it away. Um, I did pull out that jig book. Um, I plan on um, sh at least showing the cover and, and I'll have the uh, um, author's names correct. Um, but it's a pattern from there. It's called a woolly bugger. It's, it's, I'm sure people have seen similar patterns um, crappie jigs uh, they do like a woolly bugger uh, type pattern it's just a a chenille body with a palmered hackle but they were doing them for walleye and pike so that'll, that'll be a fun jig to tie and I and I again will have some examples that were tied uh, by my dad back in the it, sometime in the 70s most likely every once in a while I'm, what I'm looking at this I had a feeling that as I was jibber jabbering you might be able to see there's at least one wrap on this first wrap that's kind of sticking out and that's fairly easy to correct I just slowly just bring the thread and just match up the sides and then walk it back to the head if I let go of my grip um, I kind of lose place with that second pinch um, and that's all that that is it would still if I finished the jig and it and it stuck out a little bit, it would still fish good and it wouldn't come apart. It's tied well. Finishing off the collar, you could use a whip finish tool. This head's a little bit big and you'd have to take a little bit of care not to hook the thread as you're wrapping it around on that hook eye um, or whip finish by hand which is also not a problem this thread is a size A um, this is good rod uh, rod wrapping thread I do have an awful lot of this orange Quite some time ago, I placed an order, and I must have forgot that I placed it, and I ordered it again, and then a, few, a month or so later, I get two boxes in the mail, so I use it when I can, though. Most guys around here, they still ask for that red collar. Not sure if collars make much of a difference. Uh, I'll use brown thread, black thread. on a few wraps towards the bend of the hook and a few wraps back towards the head and I'm going a little fast here if, if anybody wants me to slow down I can do that what I didn't show is um, you know trying to get that V 
shape that's part of Uh, what I'm looking to do in locking this hair on well and then once I get this pinch fixed this the other thing that I I don't often talk about and, and I did get a question recently in talking to a guy um, nearby here in Oneana New York is when we're locking this hair on so I'll put this second color on the second uh, wing on and I lock it on a couple wraps towards the bend of the hook and a couple wraps back and there's the V shape so now when I make touching wraps up to the head of the jig there's tension on my bobbin but it's not real tight I'm not I'm not really putting a lot of force on it as I go back down once I pass the halfway mark now I, I'm putting a little bit more tension and then I'll come back up not so much tension there, there's enough tension to keep this collar and the thread nice and tight as I wrap um, even when I let go you can see as it is my bobbin hangs down that's enough tension to um, keep the collar from an unraveling um, but if I kept constant tension back and forth across this collar as as you get up towards the head if you're really cranking down on it you're going to end up pushing the hair towards the the bend of the hook just naturally you know the wraps will um, it's, it's just that constant pressure and it will slowly just push it out of the way so that's that's one thing that I don't think I've ever really talked much about. Um, I just happened to think about it um, when I was talking to a guy, uh, like I said, just recently this week. So, Steve, I, I do like using silicone skirts. Uh, I had a I did a bass jig, a pattern that I really, really liked, and I added, I don't know, four or six uh, pieces on each side, and as they folded over, so that doubled. I thought it was a really pretty jig. Uh, my soon-to-be son-in-law um, caught some nice fish on it. He's a bass fisherman. I think, I do think uh, the silicone would work really, really good uh, on a walleye jig. There's a lot of things, I have a lot of things that I'd love to, you know, in the back of my mind that I'd like to play and uh, just fool around at the vise and uh, play around with uh, different things. Every once in a while, I'll just kind of collect some of the clutter and the trash that's around or if I was using feathers a few days ago and there's one or two stray feathers on my table um, and try to do different things and uh, colors is another thing like I have some there's a jig just sitting here it's a 3 8 flat um, color combination I did two or three of them and I keep one extra up here just to I fish with them and they fish good I'll try them again or keep tying them and uh, here's a here's a sample of that fly I was doing with that that's very similar to an a old-fashioned streamer um, the pike fly I just tied this on a ball head because what I was testing out um, I mentioned in uh, the last video the uh, Duco cement and how uh, they used to use that as head cement. So I thinned some down just to see uh, because it, it's been years since I've uh, tried using that. And uh, this is super durable. And basically it was two or three little baby spoons uh, measure, you know, as a measuring spoon, uh, pouring it into a little cup 
with um, a quarter sized gob of, of the Duco cement. Um, makes a really nice head cement. Only bad thing with that is that um, you gotta you gotta know how much to mix because if you don't use it all, you waste a whole bunch. What I got in the mail today um, was the Plyo Bond, which is another glue. Let me let me turn my face off. This is another glue that is mentioned a lot in the herders, uh, the herders books. So. Uh, you know, there's herders over the years uh, put out uh, books on feathers and tying and um, did so many different editions and they're really, really popular. Um, a lot of good information. I like reading some of that old stuff just because, you know, we forget, um, as an example, just this, the, the head cement. You know, I can go down to our local Dick's or get online and go to Cabela's website and, you know, I have a dozen or so head cements to choose from. And at one point in time, there, you know, you didn't have that. So you kind of had to be half a chemist and understand what your glues and lacquers were made out of and how to manipulate them to... And uh, like I said, guys would just um, dilute it with the proper thinner and then use it as a head cement. But um, in the herder's books, he always mentioned this plyo bond, and I didn't know that it was still a thing. It's an interesting glue, similar to the Duco cement, but not as tacky. Um, it's an amber color. Um, which may be good or bad. The the nice thing with that Duco cement. Let me get the clamp. The nice thing on the Duco cement is that it, it dries clear. So it, it, it did darken that red thread slightly, but you know that's that's the you know from saturating it. The the effect of the liquid on the uh, thread. Um, I'm not sure how the plyo bond would do. Uh, I think the amber color would probably tint the uh, thread slightly if, if we were using white for the collar. Uh, most definitely it would probably make it look a little dirty. Um, the thing I thought was kind of strange with this glue is it kind of smells like not necessarily burning plastic or, or burning wires but uh, if you have a, a something electrical that's starting to get hot and it's that smell before the smoke starts um, that's kind of what it smells like right out of the tube I don't think it would need as much sorry I apologize if I'm going a little fast I don't think it would need as much thinning down just because it's this is more I would say maple syrup thick as opposed to honey thick and the Duco cement is a, a step maybe slower than honey thick so maybe cold honey maybe molasses that might be a good analogy, but um, I'm I'm definitely I'm going to try this on that uh, woolly bugger jig as the uh, head cement. So that's that's one reason why I didn't finish that video yet, um, only because I want to um, do the head cement the old way or older than my. Um, lacquer from the can way. Yeah, Alex, um, that's, that's another thing too, is uh, a lot of these old jigs that I'm, I'm kind of referring to, and, and um, there's probably three or four different 
jigs that I'll end up tying but most certainly we're going to be getting into using feathers um, wood duck you know adding a wood duck flank that striped feather flank I hate using them a full feather on a walleye jig or a full three or four feathers on a walleye jig only because they're expensive and I like using them for my Catskill dry flies but uh, we're going to use some And yes, yeah, I agree. The water-based cements are good. I like the Loon products. And, uh, you know, to be honest, some of the things I do is uh, I don't like to change. <laughs> I know there's, I know there's um, good products out there. Uh, in some ways they're better um, most certainly you know it's a little bit healthier um, I'm not huffing my lacquer thinner but it, it's not always the best thing and I'll tell you guys we don't have smell of vision here it doesn't reek in this office however um, my kids do make fun of the fact that this room has a um, mothball smell. I do use mothballs in the bags with my tails. Um, most of my tails and feathers are in another part of the house down here. But I do have a small box under the table and you might have saw me rooting around um, back by those um, file cabinets that are behind me. And those file cabinets are all filled with large plastic bags of uh, bucktails. So I do toss every six months or so, I'll toss a couple mothballs in each drawer. And uh, I know there's better ways to keep the materials. To tell the truth, I, I enjoy that smell. It reminds me of my childhood and of the same thing I complained about every time I went into my dad's tying space you know it smells like mothballs but. I'm not sure I mentioned I do have other colors to do on this of course the I, I haven't been able to keep Perch and Fire Tiger in the box. Every time I've tied something, it's gone out the door. Uh, those are probably the next colors I'm, dot, I'm tying of this size. Uh, Sandpike, of course. And um, a lot of olives. With the gobies that we've ha we have in the lakes locally now, um, a lot of guys have been... Uh, finding gobies in the stomach of the walleye and uh, you know of course we're tying jigs to match the hatch so to speak so olives olive and white olive in this uh, soda fizz color it's a creamy it's not it's not a white cream it's kind of a yellow cream almost the color of this to be honest if this was smeared on a white tail I bet you'd be this color um, but do a sandpike pattern those three are, are the patterns that I tie all year um, trying to keep up with with the demand Uh, one of the other things I was asked about recently was um, processing tails. And I don't do a whole bunch, mostly because the wife would kill me. I do, uh, you know, I have a dozen or so buddies that hunt every year. I hunt. Um, toss that tail. Um, so every year I have, I don't know, a couple dozen bucktails and uh, I'll split them 
and take the bone out and uh, salt them and I usually just leave them on a tray in the garage throughout the winter and then uh, in the spring you know a nice sunny day I'll wash them and clean them and um, then leave them out in the sun to dry and event you know I've, I've had a few questions about um, the process with that so I'm I probably won't do it this summer though I might be dying something um, here shortly uh, there's a color that I, I just can't find so I, I might do a couple videos of that and I've told the stories before when my dad used to process feathers and tails um, everything from buying tails by the hundreds of pounds and uh, processing them cleaning them used to watch guys that could debone a tail without a knife they would just kinda I don't know t twist it in a way where they can they could just take the bone right out and then they take their knife and slit it up to split it and uh, We've always used salt, but borax is a popular thing to salt your tails with. Nice jig. We were doing so many, we, we wouldn't um, pin them out or nail them to a board or anything. We just put enough salt on them to keep them flat and uh, lay them out. And then once they were dried and cleaned and washed we would then uh, dye them every color of the rainbow but it's a it's a messy process it takes up a lot of space um, you know as when I was a teenager my father was a bachelor my folks had split uh, so you know his apartment was jig tying central so every room in the house was used for something um, if, it, if it didn't if it wasn't used for dyeing or processing feathers and tails it was used for tying jigs or packaging um, I think my dad even had shelves in the bathroom <laughs> to be honest so And then if anybody's familiar with the place he had up on Oneida Lake and the workshop he had there and the big tying room. And but by that time he wasn't, wasn't dying tails. It's nice now how we can just, you know, get on the Google box and uh, you can order anything you want. We got almost a dozen tied tonight so far. Like I said, these go fairly quick. And we actually had, what was it, 15 minutes of me running around with no sound, right? Yeah, this cream, this cream color, uh, Alex, I don't know if it was a mistake or not. I remember my dad talking about it. I've had this bag for a long time and I've only used it occasionally for jigs for myself. And I was going through the um, one of the drawers in the file cabinet. I was looking for, I've been trying to find a chartreuse. I have an awful lot of chartreuse that's kind of dull like this. And I was looking for something that wasn't UV but was a nice bright strong colored chartreuse and um, just going through the bags I probably have two or three hundred hundred of these tails and they're not all the best quality or in, quality in terms of you know when we go to Cabela's and we we see a tail on the wall we want a nice big northern bucktail 
This tail is probably seven or eight inches long. The hair is medium, but it's a nice tail. It's split, split a little um, crooked um, where, you, where you got some of the white uh, split and I just broke it because it's dry um, because we've had it for so long. But there, it's a nice tail. I like to use that with a natural brown. Uh, it makes a really, really nice looking jig um, or a three colored sand pike. I also use it, I might have some on this rack. Let me see if I have a sample. I just moved my forceps out of the way and I can't find them. So this is just an olive with that, with that color. And like I said, you know, I've been doing so many of those goby colors. So this was this was a, a color that did really well at a few shops this past spring. And it's that that cream color with an olive back. So and and Ed, here's a jig that I don't use the red for the collar, so Make sure I get that on the right rack. That was a half uh, ounce head. The last of those that hopefully I tie for a while. I've been tying so many half ounce heads I, I actually have to sit down and paint. Yeah, dying, Alex, I agree. Um, and if you get set up where you don't have to, you know, empty your pots or you can get some of the fancier, uh, what is it, Vineyard is the English company. You get some of the fancier dyes, but then you have to have a stove and we, we, we would heat the tails to almost boiling. And that was, as a kid, that was one of my very first jobs, is stirring the pot and then scoop it, you know, getting the big tongs and getting them out of the, getting them out of the pot. Then you always forget one or two and they get really, really dark. Sometimes those accidents are good, sometimes not so good. I have another color that's very, I like it a lot and don't, sell a whole bunch um, don't know why because it works great is um, using a blue dun and uh, what what are they called uh, I want to just say wolf jigs but but they do more than jigs um, it's a it's a store out of Canada and uh, he's, he's a guy that I've been dealing with for a few years now and will dye up some really nice colors. I don't know if, I, if he's selling them to other people or if, or if I'm just buying these specific colors, but there's a blue done that he does that is fantastic. And I might have a sample I can show you. I don't have... I caught a walleye uh, two Sundays ago took the kayak out it was a super nice day and I actually had some time which was nice and um, caught a, a hand you know I don't know four or five I didn't I didn't fish very long it was only a few hours um, but I uh, was up at Whitney Point Reservoir which isn't far from me and uh, this color I couldn't we really weren't I was fishing with a couple other guys. Nobody's really getting anything. Um, and we were trying all sorts of color combinations, sizes. Um, one guy was even throwing stick baits. Um, and then I switched over to the blue dun with it, with uh, a, the slight chartreuse. Um, so I don't have this the specific pattern, but this is the color. So blue done with this kind of light chartreuse, and then 
we used the crinkle mirror flash for the tinsel on the side. So this crinkle mirror flash is kind of bluey, purpley, kind of looks like snow um, in a way. Um, you know, if uh, snow from a cartoon. So how you would represent that with blues and light blues and darker blues and, you know, sparkly. It, it kind of reminds me of um, my granddaughter's uh, frozen costume so but uh, just a few strands of that down each side of that chartreuse and blue done and the jig had a brown head and uh, just worked great uh, I think I caught all my fish on that that color that afternoon so Alex, are you from New York State? We have a sportsman's warehouse, uh, I don't know, an hour west of us towards Horseheads. But I'm, I'm not sure. I thought that was just kind of a small local company that bought uh, the old Gander Mountain. But I've actually, I, I do find materials there. I apologize, I slowed down just a little bit just so I can read some of the comments. Yes, yeah, Steve, I'll, I'll, I'll make it a point. Um, probably this fall I'll, sh I'll do a, a dyeing video and then um, plan on getting a little bit more in-depth. And uh, what, what I, I guess I would hope to do is this fall uh, show how to prepare the deer tails insult them and then do another part in the spring when they've been salted all all winter long and uh, cleaning them off cleaning them getting the salt off and washing them and uh, drying them and then doing a video on a little bit more in, in depth on um, dyeing them. So there's a couple different uh, dyes that I like to use. I did mention the um, Vineyards, I, I think it's called. It's an English company and it's mostly used for textiles. Um, but I really like their acid dyes. Um, the Rit, which is what you'd find here um, at Joanne Fabrics or Walmart or um, you know, craft stores, that type of thing, but it's the type of dye that you would use for um, tie-dye t-shirts and dyeing prom dresses and making sure your shoes match your dress for going out to a wedding or something. Again, I use uh, vinegar as an acid um, in the writ dyes. You don't have to, but I, I add the, um, we use white vinegar for the acid part of that um, recipe. And uh, I boil them, what we call boil them, but you know, we heat them in a pot to almost boiling, which helps set the dye. And there's a couple other brands too. So uh, what I might do is, um, you know, I'll spend a few bucks and I can get the different kinds and show the um, different ways to uh, dye tails. I'm not going to do the silly things like use Kool-Aid or the things that do work, but you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through those steps. It, I'm, 
you know, talking about doing videos, I'm really up for doing pretty much anything. But I, I'll have to, you know, here, just to tell you a story. When I first started doing the YouTube videos and back around the time... I did the one video, the first video talking about um, the permanent markers that we use. My second idea, you know, so, well, let me can let me take a step back though. Um, with the permanent markers, I spent I don't know 150 bucks um, because everything I, I wanted to order it just like anybody would uh, to kind of give you the true idea of the overall cost including shipping ordered a couple markers from uh, fly shops that are in my opinion way overpriced um, particularly when I came from a commercial art type background and I know at the art store these markers weren't weren't that expensive um, but my after doing that video I wanted to do a video on uh, bobbin holders and so I I really like I enjoyed whether whether people thought that video was good or bad overall I thought it was a fun uh, thing to do I, I enjoyed it so I wanted to do a little bit nicer job with showing bobbins and so I had a budget 250 bucks um, plus I had bobbins that I owned um, that were still new in the package that I knew how much they cost uh, I even splurged on a couple bobbins in the over $50 range and I couldn't finish the video I, I disliked the process so much I actually um, erased the files and I in a lot of my close friends got a lot of real nice bobbins for stocking stuffers and Christmas presents that year um, and the problem I had with it is a is I couldn't be honest without completely criticizing some of these bobbins especially the really expensive ones and I know there's some tires that will disagree all day about um, you know these these bobbins just have a brass tube I've, I've used these bobbins for well over 10 years this bobbin that I'm holding right now easily over 10 years it's just as smooth as it was the first day I don't think I need porcelain I do have some porcelain bobbins I have some real fine fine uh, fly tying threads um, delicate silks that I do use special bobbins um, my fly tying bobbin that I use every day is a Renzetti um, with the ruby tip and that's that bobbin is is about the limit that I would spend on a bobbin and they run 25 30 bucks to me, that's that's way overpriced. And a regular hobbyist, um, somebody who's only tying a few jigs for themselves occasionally, you don't need you don't need a a, a bobbin that costs more than ten bucks, in my opinion. Um, so I did the I did the video, and um, I just I hated it, and and I. You know, I tried to I tried to say nice things about the bobbins that I I honestly thought were were terrible. You know, because you you read the package and you kind of repeat some of that junk. You know the the porcelain tip and how it protects your thread and the feel and the touch and you know you can tighten down the screws on the side. Well, that's not how I tie. And. Um, Maybe I should learn how to do that. I'd probably, you know, maybe I'd have a thousands of followers and be a, a YouTube uh, sensation. But I don't know. I had I had such a hard time with that, and I just I couldn't follow through with it. So I try not to. Um, I'm. No. 
let's see. My chat disappeared, but I think everything else is going okay. Yeah, I know Danville and Rochester. Yep. So I've been I've been babbling and babbling. I don't I wasn't paying attention. I don't know if the chat was just off on this little monitor that I have here or if there was something wrong with the YouTube. I don't know guys. I'm this is a one man show. I'm doing everything in front of the camera and behind the scenes, so Okay, Sportsman's Warehouse must be a bigger chain then. Yeah, the store that we have here, it's the old Cabela's, or the old uh, Gander Mountain. We had a Gander Mountain here right in Johnson City. Kind of wish they uh, put something there. So we, we completed a dozen. And we're going to wrap this up shortly. We've been uh, tying a little over an hour and chit-chatting. Um, I really happy with the amount of people that actually stopped in and um, names of uh, names that I recognize and, and we've chatted back and forth in other videos um, so thanks to everybody who's showed up so far um, I'm gonna take these jigs and I'm gonna finish the collars I have my lacquer based head cement and this is lacquer uh, just straight out of the can with a few drops of lacquer thinner um, this is this is warm maple syrup viscosity. <laughs> I could probably get more technical, but I'm a little hungry, I think. Thinking about pancakes apparently. So I do let the head cement uh, overlap onto the fibers of the tail just slightly and capillary action will draw that under in in between the hair fibers and back under the the collar I have a spinning rack here that um, holds uh, Sorry, I'm having a brain fart. My sixth grade math. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Twenty-four dozen. Wow. Maybe it's getting late. Um, I have a spinning rack here that holds twenty-four dozen. And usually I will tie... A whole uh, eight dozen per side so eight dozen per side I'll tie a whole eight dozen and then I'll stop and I'll put the um, head cement on all of them and usually by the time I get to the end the first dozen is about dry but if I keep tying and just go to the next size I usually let them sit there for a day and then I'll throw them in a bag and uh, I have uh, baseball card boxes that I have filled so I have three th those baseball card boxes have three rows so I can put I have uh, what is it a three inch by five inch bag put a dozen in here you fold it over you staple it so this bag goes in the baseball card box and it holds roughly 30 dozen or so per row so each box has close to a hundred dozen jigs and uh, that's that's what I like to keep on hand um, and I do it just for the popular heads and sizes when I when I was tying um, a lot more, you know, this is just a part-time job for me. 
um, something that I just enjoy doing. I would sit and tie whether I had a business or not. Um, but when I was really pushing it a lot harder and driving a lot farther, going to a lot more bait shops, uh, making my rounds every two weeks in the uh, throughout the summer, um, I would keep more jigs on hand. But um, the ball heads, the barumba heads, the flat heads, those are the primary head shapes that I keep tied. So one quarter all the way up to five eighths. And then in these flat heads, I actually do a three quarter and a one ounce. Those I used to um, travel uh, all the way up to the St. Lawrence and uh, sell the shops up there. I still have some customers that'll give me a call, but for the most part, I don't make that big drive like I used to. Um, I used to take the whole weekend, Saturday and Sunday, and just make a big loop. My dad, when I was a kid, I remember he would leave Friday night, deliver jigs at lakes along the way. He'd be gone until Sunday night. Of course, he'd be fishing in between there too. Um, it was a good way for him to know different lakes and different areas. But, you know, he traveled a lot. Not just selling jigs. His regular profession, he worked for a company that fixed business machines. So, 60s and 70s, that was typewriters. And as copiers became a thing, you know, fixing those and... Um, but he would travel all over New York State. He knew every back road and stream and lake and got to know every fisherman, every bait shop. So, but as my kids, you know, we as, as we started having kids and, you know, you get into kids sports and junior high and high school and so life just takes over and I've I've scaled back the amount of travel I do for selling jigs. So, I apologize again, you know, if I'm just chit chatting and not checking these comments. Here we go. This is the last one. So, we've tied for an hour got through some of these mistakes I'll be sure to um, make sure that my wireless is uh, charged properly so I didn't even have the picture in picture and you've been listening to me babble like a moron <laughs> oh my goodness So, like I said, one-man show, trying to run the equipment and be the star, right? So, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. I know I don't um, schedule these things. They're kind of impromptu. Sometimes they're early in the morning, and um, you know, this one just happened to be on a Friday night. Um, I'll continue to do these. I just like the tie, and uh, it really doesn't... Um, take a whole lot of effort just to turn on a couple cameras and uh, make sure that the microphone's charged so but uh, we'll make sure that things go a little bit smoother next time probably do this again next week Thursday or Friday um, seems pretty typical like I said I'm gonna finish up try to finish up a video this weekend of that woolly bugger um, while I jig again looking at jigs from you know back in the day late 60s early 70s and I'll dig out those books so people can see some of the um, books from my collection and uh, I'll get the names and the titles correct um, as always if you like what we did even if you're watching after uh, the live stream is over go ahead put some comments down below I try to read everything and I'll respond uh, best I can um, 
hit that like button subscribe so you don't miss any new content we're still you know climbing slowly up to that 500 subscriber mark and uh, we're going to do a um, giveaway when i hit five 500 subscribers we'll find out the type of fishing or um, jigs or flies that you like and we'll, we'll tie up a set of jigs for the person that gets picked for that so i'd like to again thanks to everybody that showed up tonight i apologize for some of the technical difficulties we had um we keep trying to get better so until next time everybody keep tying and tight lines